Calvary. That's a blessing. All right, good to be here this morning. And uh, I spoke at uh, Howes Anderson College Chapel for ten consecutive years, believe it or not, to a crowd twice this size. Every chapel service for ten years, about six times a year, 60 to 70 messages in ten years. And uh, so I love to speak to college uh, young people. I miss it, and I've only been here a few times, and so I covet the opportunity. I think the last time I was here, uh, Brother Kaiser had passed away that same week after I was here. I remember I was at the Gulfport, Mississippi Library when my son Paul called me to tell me the news, and I was just uh, down in uh, Gulfport last week, went right by what's left of that library and the other buildings. And so you never know how much time you have to do what you have to do for the Lord. And so I'm glad to be with you this morning for a very important uh, chapel session. Um, I have to, ru- have to hu- hurry here because I have a lot of things to do. How many of you good folks out there, you don't know me from Adam? I've never preached a sermon you've ever heard before. Let me see your hand. Wow. How many have I been in your church before? All right. Wonderful. How many don't give a flip? All right. All right. Now, remember, I'm his friend. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear? I'm his friend. Don't forget that. Okay. I'm one of his stranger friends, though. I remember the last time I spoke in that conference, you came up after I preached that. He's got a different delivery, doesn't he? That's like that guy that killed 20 people with a chainsaw and they interviewed his next door neighbor. And he said, what kind of man was he? He said, he was a quiet man. And uh, uh, all I have to do this morning quickly is give you a commercial. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have my book, uh, my first book on the King James Bible. Uh, this came out in 1993. It's $20 retail, and I'm going to give you a blue light special, make them available for $10. I add that they, they probably made an announcement Wednesday. I passed the news along here so you'd have a few days to break into your piggy bank, uh, but heads up wise. But they're out in the lobby, the main lobby, wherever that is, and uh, they're $20 retail. They're $10. How many of you have this book already? And most of all you men ought to certainly have a copy. And it's in its 13th printing, still in hardback. Uh, so we're, we, had, we just printed 4,000 a couple of weeks ago. But it's out there that for $10, as many as you want to get. But you'll have to get them before you leave uh, for the, on the bus. And, and my wife will be there helping me. My pastor's down here, wave Brother Reagan, and my wife and son here to help. So you quickly come by and grab, no, no, uh, no looting. Just be sure to give money. Give the money, we'll give you a book. Now, Sunday night... Uh, I'll be speaking uh, at the church, and I'll have my new book available then. Uh, this is my third book, and it's called How Satan Turned America Against God. Do any of you out there know that the book's been in your church? Raise your hand. A few of you. We've sold first printing of 5,000 sold out in 60 days. We're in a second printing of 10,000. It just came out in April. And it's 1,000 pages with 68 photographs. And uh, uh, it's volume one of a series I'll be writing, Lord willing, called Understanding the Times. And I, I promise you, the sermon you'll hear Sunday night will be the most unusual sermon you'll ever hear in your whole life. You just come and see. And when you're an evangelist, you only have to have a few sermons. Uh, we don't have to do what the pastors do, come up with something uh, fresh every week. We just tweak the thing, you know, constantly. And so you'll come Sunday night and you'll hear some things that the Lord hadn't heard yet. And uh, Sunday night, and the book will be available. There are $40 at the Christian bookstore. There will be $30 on Sunday night, so be prepared to get a few. All right. Um, let's see here. Now, let me get down to the, the message. Uh, Ecclesiastes, don't, don't turn to it. I'll give you another verse to turn to in a moment. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. Did you get that? The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, not might be, not could be, but will be. Thus the axiom that history repeats itself. The only lesson that men ever learn from history is that men never learn from history. Uh, Later on, the writer goes on to say, there is no remembrance of former things. Human beings fail to remember the past. That's a scriptural teaching in the first book of the first chapter of Ecclesiastes. Now I'm about to state a historical reality. I don't have very many specialties, but I like to study history. That's about the only thing I spend a lot of time on. So what you're getting ready to hear now is an historical reality. All. You know what the word all means, right? All Christian dash Bible dash Baptist, whichever word you want to use, all Christian colleges eventually apostatize. Someone was going to get me some water up here. Is there any water here? Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that, Pastor Six. Now, it's very important you get that first statement. 
all Christian colleges eventually apostatize. Not most, not, not the bad ones, everyone that ever starts eventually apostatizes. That's a fact of history. Mr. Lenin, father of the Communist Party, once said, facts are stubborn things. Would to God that Baptist preachers had the sense and the grasp of reality that the father of modern communism possessed. That's a fact. William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri, started in 1840 as a Baptist college. It's quite a place to visit. Pastor's been there, I'm sure. He's told me some things about it. You go there. I've been there a few times. You go there, you can see Charles Spurgeon's library in the basement of that former Baptist school. You can see the painting of George Washington being baptized by the Baptist chaplain, John Gano, painted in 1911. You can see the, the sword that George Washington carried through the war, given to him by the Marquis de Lafayette, that he surrendered to his Baptist preacher friend at the end of the war in deference to the preacher's commanding officer, commander-in-chief, you know, the captain, brought us through the war. That sword is there. The painting is there. Spurgeon's library is there. But wait a minute. 2001, Time Magazine voted William Jewell College Liberal Arts College of the Year. It belongs to the pagans tonight. Now, if you can't afford to drive all the way to Kansas City, just drive on down to Chattanooga and walk along the campus of Tennessee Temple and see what's there. Yet, it is not so with regard to the local Baptist churches. Local Baptist churches do not have to apostatize. Many do, but they do not have to. Do you know what the first church was in the state of Tennessee? The very first church of any denomination? Any denomination. Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church, Great Tennessee. Started in the late 1760s, somewhere thereabouts. First church in the state of Tennessee. Started out of the Sandy Creek Baptist Church in Liberty, North Carolina. I've preached there before. Pastor's a Bob Jones graduate, wanted me to come in to preach on the King James Bible in the last 10 years. That church is still going strong. It's over 300 years old, close to 300 years old, still going strong. Churches don't have to apostatize. All colleges eventually do. But see, there's something unusual about so-called higher Christian education. There's just something about that. You know what Martin Luther said? Martin Luther said the first time the devil ever showed up in the Bible, he was sitting under the tree of knowledge. And he's never left since. It could have something to do with that scripture, knowledge puffeth up. I don't know. King James Bible could be true. You never can tell. You say, Dr. Grady, don't you have five college degrees? Yes, I do. Four earned, one, one honorary. But see, I know how to tell Italian jokes. The education didn't stick. I didn't let it stick. Too dangerous. If it sticks, you could be in trouble. How many of you know why Italians have short necks? Nobody? This is a New Jersey joke, so get ready. All the time they stand in front of the judge. I never heard of the guy. I don't know. That's, see, you can laugh. I got five college degrees and I know how to tell Italian jokes. That's a rare blend. Pastor told me in the office a few moments ago, we got probably one of the strangest relationships in fundamental Christianity there. Mutt and Jeff, amen. See, you know what's different about him? He passed it in Jersey, so he understands how I think. Any, any Tonys in here this morning? Raise your hand if you're a Tony. All right? A few of you. How many of you? A couple of girls got their hands up. How many of you know somebody named Tony? Raise your hand. All right, you want to learn the deep truth this morning? You know why so many Italians are named Tony? Because when they were sticking them on the boats in Italy, sending them over to America, they were stamping them on their foreheads to New York. To New York. <laughs> now, you're not going to hear many theologians with jokes like that. Those are killers. Those are killers. I'll tell you a few more if you're good before the chapel's over. Now, while you're laughing, while you're laughing, let me sneak this in here. And so it's not a matter of if... Not a matter of if, but when. Crown will go down. No doubt about it. It has to go down. It's a human institution of higher learning. Every Christian college in history has gone down. It could go down in Pastor Sexton's lifetime. It could go down in his pastorate. It could go down 20 years after he dies, but it will go down. Certain principles will determine whether it stays alive or not. And other principles will determine whether it goes down. That's a law of history. 
Dr. Sexton paid me quite a compliment many years ago. I've never forgotten it. He looked me in the eye and he said, he said, Brother Bill, you strike me as a man of God that has a burden and has something to say. Remember saying that? You have something to say. I appreciated that. I taught at Howes Anderson College for 10 years. 400 students in my classes on an average per semester. I speak for my former students all the time across the country. But the last week I taught there, or the last week school was, was in session, my last week of teaching, the last week of chapel, maybe the second to the last chapel service of my 10 years at the school, Dr. Jeff Owen stood up to speak, and he was the vice president, one of the vice presidents of the college at that time. And this is what he said. I was sitting in the faculty section. He said, now, a lot of you folks out there, especially you faculty members, don't want to admit this, but that message Brother Grady preached back in 1987 probably saved this college. And we had a revival broke out. I preached one message. It was the it was, it was most unusual message in the history of Howells Anderson. It was called the Devil's Pool Party. And, and, we, and, 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 and it just so happens that God did something special that ten years later, the Lord let me hear it from the lips of the vice president of the school that that one message probably saved the college. And, and it's not contradicting what I'm saying. It added years to the life of the school is really what he was saying. And that's what I hope the Lord will do this morning with some of these few comments the Lord has put on my heart uh, this week to speak on. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 12. Judges, chapter 12. We'll read a couple of verses here and then have a quick prayer and then just jump right into it with my eyeball on the clock back here. Judges 12, verse 1. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands, and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead, and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim, among the Ephraimites and among the Manassehites. And the Gileadites took the passages. Note that. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so, that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, then said they unto him, and this is my text verse for the morning, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Forty-two thousand Jews were slain because they couldn't pronounce a single word. What about that? Let's pray together. Father, we ask you now to have mercy upon us and speak to our hearts. Open up the Word of God. Give us the truths that will add years to this institution. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Due to the sins of pride, ego, jealousy, or whatever, the Jewish tribe of Ephraim declared war on their brethren. As we often see today, the world will rarely do you as dirty as the professing Christian will. Verse 1, it said, We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. <laughs> That's Japheth's neighbor. Japheth's neighbor said, We're going to burn your house down around you. The world will never do you as bad as a Christian will do you half the time. When the Lord delivers Jephthah and the men of Gilead, the remnant of the Ephraimites find themselves on the wrong side of the Jordan. 
So the password Shibboleth, meaning stream or flood, is used because the Ephraimites couldn't pronounce that word. And so it is today. I prayed all week, several weeks about this chapel. So I had so many ideas going through my head. I was so confused. And then out of, the, out of the clear blue sky, the Lord put such an unusual verse and thought on my heart. And I, I feel certain that this is a, a, a thought that is going to help a lot of you. But, it's, but, but it's, a, it's a rough idea, but it's a biblical idea. This morning, I wish to speak on this subject. Seven signs of pseudo King James Onlyism. Seven signs of pseudo King James Onlyism. I got two parts of the message. First part is the history of the King James Only controversy in my lifetime. Now, let me briefly give you some testimony here. I mean, I come up in the Catholic Church in New York City. What do I know? You know, we used to school was so tough when they'd sack the quarterback to go after his family next. Amen. I never had any Bible training. And I had to learn all this by observation. Now, here's my testimony, and I'll run through it quickly. I was saved in 1974 while I worked at the Philadelphia airport for British Airways, saved through the radio ministry of Oliver B. Green and a local Baptist pastor. I joined the local church after I was getting saved there. That was in 1974. He was a graduate of Bob Jones, on the board of Bob Jones, and given an honorary doctorate from Bob Jones. I love the man, but to this day, 30, 31 years pre preacher, I never preached for my own pastor one time. Never got invited. And yet he loves me, or it says he loves me, and I'm sure he does. But this is the way the, a lot of times the school is running clicks. Some of you don't understand about that type of thing. But anyway, I was the, he was there six months after I got saved and then left, kind of pushed out by the deacons. And then a year and a half after that, after my call to preach, I left. So I was there two years. And I went off to Hiles Anderson College. Now, at that time, that was the height of the Jack Hiles, John Rice, big church movement, early 1970s. From 1976 to 1981, I, I sat in the classrooms of Hiles Anderson College. Jack Hiles preached out of the King James Bible every service in the church house. But in the, but in the classrooms, the teachers, I'm talking about the early 1970s, corrected the Word of God before my eyes. One of the guys that corrected it to Moses in prison tonight for 116-year jail sentence, Joe Combs. I can still remember him saying, that he spoke with a lisp. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. There is in italics, that's the, wrong, that's the wrong rendering. It's supposed to be, the fool hath said in his heart, no God. I'm not doing something. Well, he's in jail for over a century tonight, messing with that book. Uh, Brother Reese was a teacher back in those days. If you don't believe me, go ask him. He'll tell you all about those days. Dr. Hiles' commentaries that you can buy tonight correct the King James Bible, especially the commentary in the book of Revelation, openly. You say, why did, Dr., why did Dr. Hiles and his school correct the King James Bible back in the 1970s while I was there watching it happen? Well, here's the, here's the, here's the explanation historically. Dr. Hiles' mentor, his mentor, Dr. John Rice, known as the captain of our team, not only corrected the King James Bible, ignorantly, and I say ignorantly in a way he, didn't, he thought he was right. He wasn't doing it deceitfully, not at all. As a man of God, love the Lord. I pastored a church for five years and thought the King James Bible was, was, was inferior to other versions. I didn't know any better myself. He not only corrected the King James Bible regularly, but strongly recommended the perverted works of Westcott and Hort in his own writings that you can buy to this day. On page 383 of the book, Our God Breathed Book, the Bible, Published by the Sword of the Lord in 1969, Dr. John Rice wrote these words, and I quote, Now there is available the New American Standard Bible New Testament, published by Moody Press. The American Standard Version of 1901, widely acclaimed for its word-for-word -word fidelity to the Greek, has been painstakingly revised by the Lachman Foundation in the light of the latest textual advances. Dr. Wilbur M. Smith says, quote, certainly the most accurate and most revealing translation of the New Testament that we now have. That is the end of Dr. Rice's statement. Now, for the record, Dr. Frank Logston, the man who interviewed and screened the translators for the New American Standard Version, and then who later went on to write the preface to the New American Standard Version, eventually did what the captain of our team never had the light apparently to do. I mean, the man that wrote the preface to the New American Standard woke up and repudiated the entire project and had his name removed. Is that right, Pastor Reagan? That took a lot of guts to do that. 
Matter of fact, in one letter he wrote, which I have a copy of, he says, I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. Now you ask, why did Dr. Rice endorse Westcott and Hort and the corrupt Bibles? There's a reason for that historically. Because the mentor of Dr. Hiles, referring to John Rice now, because the mentor of Dr. Hiles, who also, by the way, mentored your pastor and mentored me, was himself mentored by the celebrated Dr. R.A. Torrey. Brother Reese will tell you that's true. Now, while Dr. Torrey started off being mentored by D.L. Moody, he later went off to Germany for advanced studies, where he became severely tainted in favor of the modern Bibles. Thus, you will find his many references to the revised version in his writings. So we have Westcott and Hort influencing R.A. Torrey, who influenced John Rice, who influenced Jack Hiles, who influenced me through his teachers that were allowed to criticize the King James Bible in the classroom. Remember, I lived through all this history. I kind of like was there when it happened. During this time, the lone voice defending the English text of the King James Version as the final authority for God's people was a man named Peter Ruckman, who was a graduate of Bob Jones University. David Otis Fuller, uh, was a great man at that time, but he was not pushing for the English translation as much as he was for something else, which you'll understand that in just a few minutes. Hang in there with me. Now, Dr. Ruckman's following back in those days was very, very meager, but there were some heavy hitters that were solidly behind what he was trying to do, but not many. Dr. Bob Gray of Jacksonville, Florida. Dr. Beecham Vick in Detroit, Michigan. Dr. John Rawlings in Open Ohio, and especially Brother Lester Rollo. The Holy Spirit continued applying pressure to the preachers across the, uh, the spectrum. And so finally, in 1984, Dr. Hiles converted to the King James only position. I have a copy of the sermon tape he preached in April of 1984 entitled, Logic Must Prove the King James Version. Now, Mark Rasmussen, who was uh, instrumental in the beginning of the school here, told me his lips to my ears that the way Dr. Hiles was brought about was through his father, Roland Rasmussen, a Bob Jones graduate who became a renegade in favor of the King James, butting heads with his own uh, 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 alumni or uh, alma mater. And he sent Dr. Howes several outlines from Dr. Ruckman's material on the King James Bible. And whether Dr. Howes ever understood it or not, he eventually was convinced that this is the way at least the Lord is directing things. And he came out for the King James Bible. In 1986, then this, all, this was going on while I was pastoring a church. In 1981, uh, uh, I left Hiles Anderson uh, in the middle of the criticizing of the King James Version time and went off to pastor a church in Idaho. Now, I was out there to 86. In 84, Dr. Hiles saw the light, see? So I come back to teach in 1986. Didn't know anything else other than the King James was okay like that. But now everybody's King James this, King James that. I hardly recognized the joint. Everyone was beating a King James only drum. And here's something else. Overnight... Dr. Howes was now the undisputed champion of the King James Bible. Heard him say many times, well, I'm sitting out there in stunned disbelief. I'm going to spend the rest of my life defending this book and all that stuff. And I said, what now? I say, what now? Who now? What's coming down here? However, don't miss this part of the story. However, nobody had a clue as to why the King James Bible was the final authority. Nobody had a clue. I, I started asking questions. I got mad. I'd preach chapel sermons and make a joke about the King James issue because I couldn't get anybody to tell me why. In 1988, Jack Patterson gave me a book called Manuscript Evidences by Dr. Peter Ruckman. I began reading it because no one else could give me any answers. And the longer I read, the more convicted I got, and I got shook up. And, and then out of nowhere, it dawned on me that that King James Bible was the Word of God based on all the voluminous material, documented material in that particular book. After my eyes flew open, I began reading everything on the subject. I then developed a course at Howes Anderson College called Contempt for Theology. It was printed Contemporary Theology, but I called it Contempt for Theology. In 1992, the Lord led me to write my book, Final Authority. Dr. Ruckman advised me, whatever you do, son, don't put my name in the book and don't quote me in the book so it can get out to where the people need it. Talk about an egomaniac. What about that? And I listened to him. I got critical letters. I see in this 400 page about the King James Bible, you quote everybody but Dr. Ruckman. Is there a conspiracy? Yada, yada. That's kind of stuff my wife read the man with me. She'll tell you about it. In 1993, 
my book came out, Final Authority, in, the, in March of that year. The very same month, Gail Ripplinger's book came out, New Age Bible Versions. And those two books, overnight, just took off like a rocket ship. We sold our first 5,000 copies out in, I think, 30 days. My wife, we, we didn't know what was going on. Uh, thousands and thousands, 5,000, none of the 5,000, none of the 5,000. We had a UPS truck coming to our home in Crown Point, Indiana, every day picking up deliveries. Gail Ripplinger's book went all over creation. It was a left and a right, and it started a riot. By 1995, two years later, the enemy was in serious retreat. An article in the October 23rd issue of Christianity Today conceded the following quote, Among conservative Christians, a grassroots backlash against contemporary English language Bibles has triggered a renewed interest in the famed King James Version with its word-for-word -word translation and its long-standing authority, end of quote. Now, despite the fact that I'm a native New Yorker, I am not an egomaniac. I don't want to take credit for all that. One man by the name of Dr. Ruckman has written five and a half feet of books. Five and a half feet, 30 years laboring on that issue like a choo-choo, like a roller coaster, clunk, 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 going up to the top, see? And then in 93, the Lord impressed me and this woman, Gail Ripplinger, put our little two cents in and pushed it over the top. And then Katie barred the door and it's been going down on a wild ride ever since. But I was just there at the end of the show. I'm not about to take credit for something I did not do. Now here's where my sermon is starting to pivot right here. From that point on, I began to notice three groups of King James only Christians develop. The first group, I would say it was the smallest of the three, had a genuine burden to tackle the issue. They took 2 Timothy 2.15 seriously. Study to show thyself approved unto God. An unsaved Jew by the name of Albert Einstein used to say, I never let my schooling interfere with my education. Pastor reveres the memory of Charles Spurgeon. You know what he said? He said, if a man would be quoted, he must quote. If a man would be read, he must read. And any man who refuses to use the brains of other men proves he has no brains of his own. Men and brethren, you need to read. That's the end of the quote. And so this crowd was getting a grip on why the King James Bible was right. A second group, I would say it was the largest of the three, they got converted to the King James Bible only because Dr. Howe's converted. I call them airheads for Jesus. They weren't limited to Dr. Howe's ministry. They're all across the country. I'll give you a hint. Pastor said uh, my daughter married a fine young man here at the college. Larry Branham. She did. But he didn't tell you how it came to be. Uh, 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 Larry Branham went to Howells Anderson College while I was a professor there. He lasted five weeks. He was sitting in a classroom one day, and one of the professors out there, I won't mention the guy's name, he said, we use the King James Version because Dr. Howells tells us to use it, and if he told us to change, we'd change tomorrow to another one. Now, my uh, redneck son-in-law from Hartsville, Alabama, thought he misheard. He went up afterwards very humbly to ask him, what did he say? Because he misheard him. And the professor told it to him and then just blew him off like teachers sometimes can do. And my son-in-law was, son was shook up. He, he, he called his mama, though, that night. If you're from Alabama, it's a mama. I grew up with ma, mother, but up in Alabama, mama. And he called mama. He was gone the next morning. Wound up down here and married my precious daughter. But then we have a third group. And the third group is as dangerous as all get out. Feeling the pressure applied by the Holy Ghost, they convert to the King James only. But only superficially. It's the most important thing I can say today, what I just said. As our Savior said, these people honor me, honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They are the Ephraimites of today professing to be something they really are not. For many, especially in the Bible college business, and there's a good 25 Bible colleges across America that profess to be King James schools, it is being done to attract students. Now, I wouldn't say this unless this was spread all across the United States of America already in its old news, and that's why I'll say it. Pensacola Christian College in 1998 put a three-video series out 
trying to get students. We're King James, yada, yada, yada. Now, you think that's a pretty good thing. Thank the Lord for a school that's King James. Well, it's, it's good if it's the real thing. But if it's pseudo King James only, isn't that's, that's what's dangerous. Now, I'll tell you what you can see on the video because I've seen it. When the third video ends, the concluding video. How many of you are familiar with the video series? Raise your hand. All right. Thank you very much. The third video ends with Dr. Dell Johnson holding this book up on the camera. It was in its, uh, I don't know, 10th printing by then, I guess, used in about 150 Bible institutes as a textbook by that time. But Dr. Dell Johnson held the book up like this and said, now, we're King James Bible here, but we don't want you to think we're radical or anything like that or like this. It's on film. I was in Milton, Florida, preaching uh, for a week somewhere, and I, call, I went over there and called Dr. Much, the head of the place, called him five days in a row, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Never returned my call one day. On Friday, I finally called, told the secretary, well, tell Dr. Much this is what I was calling about, and I'm sorry I can't reach him five days in a row. And the secretary, hand, his old Catholic expression, hand on the Bible right there. This is what the secretary said. Well, Dr. Much uh, uh, thought that uh, that's what you uh, wanted to know about, uh, discuss about the video, and he didn't uh, want to uh, uh, take uh, the call. So five days in a row, I tried to get it solved locally. Couldn't get an appointment with the man. Secretary tells me he didn't want to discuss it. One of the men there was uh, Dr. Theodore Letus. And he was uh, quite the theologian. He's an expert in European Reformation history, and he helped out during the week. And I'll get back to him in just a second. The crux of my message is this. The Bible college students in the 25-plus schools across this America, and if I were you, I would get the tape of this message and send it to everybody that's in, you can think of that's in every college in America, because I lived through this for 10 years. Every student, not every student that pays tuition money in a Bible college has a right to an honest faculty. Would you agree to that? If they say one thing, it ought to be what, what, what they really believe. Is that right? In other words, the faculty members of the Bible schools of America ought to be able to ask to pronounce the word shibboleth. And if they can't say it right, they ought to be fired. The Bible says whatsoever things are true. Is that, did I just give you a true statement? Is it honest? To help you expose the Ephraimites across America in the 25 plus schools, I want to give you quickly in the time we have left several signs of pseudo King James onlyism. These are ways you can spot professors and Christians in general who say they're King James, but they're really not. I'll give you them. They're historical, they're biblical. Make a note of them in your mind. Number one. Pseudo King James onlyites would acknowledge only in private, or most of the time only in private, that their true final authority is the Greek textus receptus and not the English text of the authorized version. You can tell by going through the campuses of these schools. Their bookstores have little or no books advocating the King James only position, unless they're written by so-called TR men. The curriculum will often require several hours of Greek and Hebrew while not having a single course on the King James Bible. When my eyes got open, the first thing I asked Jack Howes, can I teach a course on this to help these fellows get their heads straight? Cross the country and see how many courses you have on the King James Bible. You have a whole course on Greek, you could have a whole course on the King James Bible issue. There's a lot to learn. I have, a, I have 188 books in my bibliography I have to read to write this one book. Catalogs of the schools continue to print the, the what I call holdover phraseology of the pre-King James only era. Plenary and verbal inspiration for the original manuscripts only. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 real quickly and I'll show you the verse God used to wake me up. And I, I can preach this kind of a sermon humbly because I didn't believe this stuff. I was a faculty member at a Bible college and didn't believe it. I, I, I don't know anybody here from the faculty. I had no brother East. I don't know anybody else. I don't know what anybody believes here. All I can tell you is I didn't believe it. And then God had to open my eyes. I went to Philadelphia College of the Bible. You see, it got messed up. You got your Bible open to 2 Timothy 3.16? Look at verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
Now, all the seminaries will tell you that verse is talking about the original manuscripts. And therefore, only the original manuscripts can be inspired. Now, the only problem is you might want to look at the context of verse 15. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, And that from a child thou hast known the what? Holy Scriptures. Now, was Timothy reared on original manuscripts or copies of the originals? Yeah. Where does inspiration lie? In the originals only, according to the seminaries. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so if you relegate inspiration to the autographs, that means you have two types, and, and, and Timothy was reared on scriptures, then you got two types of uh, scriptures. You have inspired scriptures and non-inspired scriptures. Isn't that a mess? And so that's why the Holy Ghost starts verse 16 off with that one word. What does it say? All scripture, thank you, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It didn't say the writers were inspired. It said it was given by inspiration. Now, that's how I got straightened out. You say, the translators, translations can't be inspired. You, what, what, what school did you hear that in? First time you go through Matthew and find an Old Testament verse being quoted, you're, you're reading an inspired translation. Did you know that? The writer of the New Testament took that Old Testament Hebrew verse and translated it into Greek, into the New Testament, in the autograph, and produced an inspired translation. Don't listen to all that gas you get by those stuffed shirt professors across America. So I, I believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God in the autographs. Well, see, that's, a, that's an oxymoron. There never was a time when all the autographs were in one binding. The only Bible there has ever been, the only time you have a Bible to hold up has been a collection of copies and translated copies in our day. The Greek word for all that I just gave you is duh. The professors across the land need to be asked for a simple statement of fidelity. Do you believe that you hold in your hand a copy of the Holy Scriptures? That's the question. You ask that, they'll start stuttering and sputtering. Because then they have to say this is inspired. Ask them if they believe in the preserved words of God. Plural, not the Word of God. The Bible refers to the Bible as the Word of God with a small W. Our crowd across America gives it a capital W. That means this book has the Word of God, his thought in it. That goes back to Bruner. Try the words, plural of God. See if you can get that out of the average Christian who professes to be King James. Let me read you the true doctrinal statement of Ephraimites who teach in the faculties across America's schools. Here is their true belief. Listen carefully. Number one, no one has had a copy of the script. No one has a copy of the scripture in their possession. Number two, the word, capital W, the word of God is not the words found in any book. It is a message found in several hundred books. Number three, all books which you call the Word of God are full of mistakes, but godly men will correct them for you. Number four, no book on earth is the final authority for anything, but we will profess that a book we never saw and never existed for that matter is our final authority. And number five, man is the final authority. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Use what works, pragmatism. Use what you prefer, humanism. Come to me for an authoritative opinion, egotism, and I will base my authoritative opinion upon the authoritative opinions of authorities who taught me to get rid of the Holy Bible and replace it with the preferences and opinions of authorities. Now you know why you might listen to the tape a few times. You won't get it all in one session here. How many of you folks consider yourselves to be Baptists? Let me see your hands. I said, I knew you'd say that, of course. Well, let me ask you a question. You believe in soul liberty, right? Well, then why do some of you hold to a Protestant priesthood? If the Greek is the higher authority, then you need a priesthood to translate it for you. I don't need any Greek teacher to tell me what the Bible means. I don't think Greek teaching is wrong in a Bible college. But if, it's, if the Greek text is held as a higher authority than this English Bible, then we got a shibboleth problem. I recently visited a church with a large Bible school in the Midwest. One of the faculty members came up to me in the lobby of the church and said, Brother Grady, we appreciate your books. We've got to get back to the TR. 
I told the pastor about it. I think he's put out with me, however, <laughs> for, for telling him he has a faculty that's interested in the TR. I'm not interested in getting back to the TR. I want to stick with the English. Now, because many TR men will not admit their true convictions, you have to probe. You have to ask them for the password. You have to ask them to say shibboleth. Here's a few more signs of pseudo-King James onlyism. Pseudo-King James onlyites have an aversion to reproach. Therefore, their main goal is to appear scholarly. I'll give you a real misnomer. It's the term Bible scholar. Dictionary says a scholar is one who has mastered a subject. How many Bible scholars do you know? Kind of like that phrase, that sign outside of Atlanta, Alabama, I mean, outside of uh, 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 somewhere in Alabama, near Montgomery, I think where it is. It says Alabama Shakespeare Festival, two miles down the road. That's what you call an oxymoron, amen. I was with a uh, preacher one time. He looked out the window and saw that sign. He was from North Carolina. He said, look at there, Brother Grady. To be or not to be, at heirs to question. Amen. <laughs> hey, you got your Bibles open there? How quick can you have a sword drill with me? Quickly. Turn to Isaiah 66. Quickly. I only preach here about once every five years, so I've got to load you up. I'm the evangelist. I've got a nickname. I don't wear out my welcome. Isaiah 66, real quickly. Watch out for the desire to appear intellectual. It's a temptation of the flesh. It leads to a TR position over the English Bible of the authorized version. Look quickly. Uh, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 66, 1. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. Look at it. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my words. Very few Greek teachers tremble at the words of God. I remember Brother Kaiser had a very warm spirit about most all spiritual things. But very few Greek teachers tremble when they're talking about the autographs. And they, don't, they sure don't tremble when they hold a King James Bible in their hand. Turn quickly back to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. Look at verse 9 quickly. Isaiah 28, 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Wouldn't you like to know the answer to that question? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Babies. That's who God opens the book up to. Uh, don't turn to it, but Matthew eleven twenty five is another verse. Jesus said, I thank thee, O Father, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them unto babes. In the PCC video, Dr. Horton wanted a scholar for the show, so he got one by the name of Dr. Theodore Letus. The, the resume is what got him in the door. Ph.D. from the University of Edinburgh in ecclesiastical history. Honorary MTS from Emory University. Completed graduate studies in Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, St. Charles Seminary in Philadelphia, and Concordia Seminary, Fort Wayne, Indiana. B.A. in history and biblical studies from Evangel College. Author, lecturer, yada, yada, yada. However, Dr. Horton forgot a few things. Forgot to tell the folks that he was a cigarette-sucking, martini-drinking, Bible-denying, Lutheran theologian. All that, I have documentation right here. Just got to give it to you real quick. Brother Grady's new book has 2,700 footnotes in it. I don't get away with putting stuff in print unless I can back it up. Peter Jennings said, if you hear a rumor your mother loves you, check it out. D.A. Wait, Listen to this. D.A. Wait. The ultimate TR man in America, Bible for today, who's been coming around to the King James Bible more and more all the time. He told me that this man fought him for over 20 years when he's trying to defend the Texas Receptors, Dr. Wake, trying to do that. Listen to this. You know the pot calling the kettle black? Stuart Custer, Bob Jones, the number one advocate of West Cottonwood, even Stuart Custer got on PCC's case for bringing Theodore Letus in to lead that King James video series rather than D.A. Wade. D.A. Wade told me that with his own lips. Some of you four folks out there probably don't know what I'm talking about, but many of you do. But your preachers will understand this material if you don't. But, that, but that, that resume was amazing. The name, Dr. Theodore Letus. That's the stuff that people are impressed with. They like intellectual sounding things when they have to have a school. When Christians get enraptured with intellectual power, the devil has a field day with them. One of the biggest lies of the Ephraimites is there is, is their constant use, don't miss this, is their constant use of the buzz phrase, the Greek text. I learned this from Brother Reagan many, many years ago. Or the Textus Receptus. Don't miss it, as if there was only one Greek text. Or as if there was only one 
Texas Receptus. The fact is, there are at this moment three major Texas Receptus in print. And they're all different from one another. The Trinitarian Bible Society, done by F.H.A. Shrivener in 1859. It's mostly Beza's 1598 edition. Number two, J.P. Green's Interlinear Greek Text, published by Hendrickson Publishers, Peabody, Massachusetts. Another version of Shrivener's work. Number three, the Greek Interlinary by uh, George Rickerberry, published by Baker, an exact copy of Stephen's 1550 edition. At the height of the Reformation, there were 17 different TRs in circulation, all slightly different. Erasmus 1516, 1519, 1522, and the 1535 edition. Beza's 1565, 1582, 1589, 1590, and 1598 TR. Stephan is 1546, 1549, 1550, and the 1551. De Colonnais, 1534, L. Zevers, 1624, and 1623. They weren't called the TR back then, but they were the TR. And here's another shocking revelation. There is no single TR that underlies the KJV. Now, this is very important for you to get. The King James Version is an eclectic text. The translators picked and chose from a variety of these Greek texts what they were going to use. There is no one Greek New Testament that underlies this English Bible. It's very important that you get that. Their main source was Beza's 1598 edition. In the annotated text by F.A. Shrivener, produced in 1859, Shrivener lists in the back of his Bible 190 places where the King James Version rejected Beza's text for something else. 190 different places. King James translators say, well, we like Beza most of the time, but we're not going to use it here. Sometimes it was for a different Greek text. Sometimes it was a Latin text. Didn't, didn't take the Greek at all. Sometimes it was nothing. They just chose an English idiom that wasn't in any Greek text. God forbid. Every time you see that, there is no Greek for that. Sometimes they rejected the majority readings for a minority reading. 1 John 5, 7, and 8, the greatest verse in the Bible for the Trinity, it's only in about two Greek manuscripts. Almost all of the other texts have it, don't have it. Two have it, and the King James translators felt impressed. We're going to put that one in here. You can't match up this book with any Greek text. God's got that thing fixed like that, see? I'm racing along and skipping things here for time. Thus you can't have it both ways. The King James Version has no exact equivalent. You have to make a choice. Either the King James Version is your final authority or one of three different TRs. Or you can even pick one of two majority texts, which is another chapel message altogether. Hodges Farstead or the Robertson Pierpont. That's a majority text, different from the Texas Receptus. In closing, I'll leave you with just a few other signs of pseudo-King James onlyites, and I'm racing for time here. Close on the heels of a desire to appear scholarly is their preference, don't miss this, if there was ever a, a black preacher that had a sermon title, this would be it, is their preference for couth over truth. Couth over truth. Here's the thing. Well, I like what, I, I believe what he said is right, but I don't like the way he said it. The spirit isn't right, and so I won't accept it because I don't like the spirit. The couth takes preference over the truth. Well, uh, Bob Jones Sr. one time said, I'd rather hear a man say, i seen something who saw it, than hear a man say, I have seen it, who didn't see anything. And that was the wisdom of a peanut farmer. Now, you don't get any more important than this statement here. I started Final Authority with these words from a man by the name of Thornwell many centuries ago. Quote, to employ, soft, to employ soft words and honeyed phrases in discussing questions of everlasting importance, to deal with errors that strike at the foundations of all human hope as if they were harmless and venial mistakes, to bless where God disapproves and to make apologies where he calls up to stand up like men and assert, though it may be the aptest method of securing popular applause in a sophisticated age, is cruelty to man and treachery to heaven. Those who on such subjects attach more importance to the rules of courtesy than they do to the measures of truth do not defend the citadel but betray it into the hands of its enemies. Love for Christ and for the souls for whom he died will be the exact measure of our zeal in exposing the dangers by which men's souls are ensnared. And that's quite a meaty statement. Bob Jones Sr. was a peanut farmer. Bob Jones Jr. was a Shakespearean actor. Thus the statement came up, Bob Jones Jr. carpeted the sawdust trail. 
The third doesn't know what he believes, and the fourth is a, the, the, the grand, great grandson uh, is a graduate of Notre Dame University. And ask James Seidler, Harold Seidler's son, about the, the way Bob Jones now is veering away from the King James at light speed. Read the book, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, endorsed by the third, criticizing that King James Bible. These are what you call facts. And if you don't get them in a Bible college, where are you going to get them? It's the same problem that the Apostle Paul ran into in his ministry. You could call it couth over truth. You know what they accused the Apostle Paul of? They accused him of having problems with manners and how he presented himself. So I never read that in the Bible. I'll read it to you real quick. Hang on here for time. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. I'll read it to you for time. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Cross-reference here quickly. 2 Corinthians. I'm reading it so you don't have to turn to for time. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Hold on a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Say, what's that got to do with anything? Here's the key one. Verse 6, same book. Chapter 11, verse 6. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge... Do you know what the word rude means in the Webster's 1828 English Dictionary? I'll read it to you. Rough, uneven, rugged, unformed by art. Rough of coarse manners, unpolished, uncivil, clownish, rustic as a rude countryman. Rude behavior, rude treatment, a rude attack. That's how the Webster's 1828 English Dictionary describes how Paul described himself. I bet you he was a rough character to listen to sometimes. A fourth sign of pseudo-King James onlyism is a shallow knowledge of the book itself. There is a serious consequence to undermining the English text of the King James Bible by the so-called TR being rated as the higher authority over the King James English text. Over there in Psalm 15, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 15, don't turn to it, but the Lord said in verse 6, and honor not his father or his mother, ye shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. When schools have the King James Bible corrected by the TR across America, the Bible begins losing its effect on people. It's a law of the Scripture. Never forget what I'm about to say. There is a direct correlation between knowing the Bible and believing the Bible. There is a direct correlation between how much of that Bible you will eventually know versus how much of it you really believe. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as in, the, as in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You have to believe it to have it do any good for you. And if you say you believe it, but you really don't, you won't get anything out of it. Pseudo-King James Onlyites, and I'm coming down to the very end of the message now, Pseudo-King James Onlyites are some of the most shallow Bible students on the earth. They're hurting always in two critical areas, cross-referencing the Bible and the knowledge of right division. And they hardly ever get any of the real deep doctors of the Bible straight because of it. There is a stark difference between pastors of churches all across this country who were trained by shallow TR professors and men who were trained by those folks that believe the book and really believe what they say they believe it. The pastors across the country trained by TR men, most of their sermons and material deal with devotional areas, family areas, revival, patriotism, biography areas. Pastors who've been trained by King James men, their messages are full of Bible, doctrine, church history, current events, etc. Quickly, a fifth sign of King James, a pseudo King James onlyism, a clinging to a clinging to the pre-King James only era cliche of fundamentalism. A movement started by a Protestant majority with the arrival of the revised version, kicking it off. Not only am I a King James man rather than a TR man, but I also consider myself a Bible believer and not a fundamentalist. Bible believers hold to all the truth of Scripture. 
not just five or six fundamentals. The key is when you hold to just five or six positions as being serious ones, you can avoid the controversial stuff in order to practice Western pragmatism, as in purpose-driven kingdom building. For 30 years, we castigated Billy Graham for what he added for the practical reasons of getting more people, adding Catholic priests and liberal theologians to sit up here in order to preach to our people. And we quote Bob Jones to him. It's never right to do wrong. They got a chance to do right. And I know preachers all across America now cutting out this and cutting out this and cutting this controversial doctrine out because it will affect building the church. The Bible says we're supposed to declare the whole counsel of God. And then sixth, we have a host of cute cliches sneaking in. Watch for these when you ask for shibboleth. I, I believe in the King James, but I don't worship the King James. I remember when I was a student at Howes Anderson College watching uh, uh, my, my fellow students coming down and bowing down to Jack Patterson's King James Bible in the lunchroom making fun of it. Typed out on Paul's typewriter. All those cute... Well, they're still used now in the King James only time. Got to listen for them. And last but not least, we have the seventh sign of pseudo... King James only is an ambassador section. I promise you, I cut out so much junk up here. I've never preached this message before. I just put it together so quick. And I'm watching that clock and cutting out stuff, and I'm on the last page. And here's the end of the message. Listen to this. Paul wrote, <laughs> Luke wrote in Acts 22 about the Apostle Paul. Listen to this. And they gave him audience unto, verse 21, And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. He's giving his testimony, right? Everybody's listening. And then verse 22 says, And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. They went crazy when Paul brought the word Gentiles up. They were listening, and all was bang, a bomb went off in the room. I've been saved 31 years, and I believe this King James Bible ever since 1988, and I've watched since 1988. You mention one word. In the average circle of Christians or preachers, and the, a bomb goes off in the room, and that word is the name Peter Ruckman. People go crazy. Intellectual people go, they go crazy. There's a term for it. It's called Ruckmanitis. Now, let me explain this, and I'm done. If Dr. John Rice was wrong about the Bible, but right about the family, and all his writings, and we still profit from his books about the home, well, then, if the Bible says what sort of things are true, why couldn't... Christian people give Dr. Ruckman the credit he deserves for fighting for this book all for 30 some odd years despite the problem he's had, despite the fact that he's had problems with his family. It's the same thing with Dr. Rice. It's just reversed. Now you can thank the Lord that you have a pastor up here with a lot more grace than most preachers. I remember Brother Sexton telling me the other month how he bumped in the, saw Dr. Ruckman sitting at the Knoxville airport by himself and walked up to him and introduced himself to Dr. Ruckman and Shook his hand and thanked him for the position he's taken for the Bible. Very few preachers would ever do that in the circles we've come up in. It's a dirt, he's a dirty word. I've eaten in his home. I've preached for him. I've preached for him. I know him since 1988. I wouldn't know my, my, my Bible if I hadn't gotten my eyes open. So I have a, a debt of gratitude for that. You don't have to endorse everything he believes. But when you can find... Here's the, here's the key now. Shibboleth, shibboleth. Phony King James only people. If you had your eyes finally opened to the authority of this book after being deceived for so many years, it would be natural to be grateful for the one man that spent all that time trying to do it for you. Without taking all the baggage, you wouldn't hate the guy. See? Something's, not, something's funny there. A lot of King James people across America are like this. Especially when students are involved. That's why they have videos attacking a book like Final Authority. Without the name Peter Ruckman even in the book. Well, I'm finished with this piece of paper, and this is rough. The Ephraimites, who couldn't pronounce the word shibboleth, died on the spot. So it's a dangerous thing to profess one thing when you're not what you profess to be. And I'm done with this. The other day I got a phone call from a pastor in Kansas who told me that he was reading my final authority book and finally had his eyes open to the King James and, and he was so thankful for it. And then he saw the PCC video and at the end when he saw my book criticized, he was surprised. Contacted Dell Johnson and then he eventually sent an email to Dr. Theodore Letus. He signed the email, your brother in Christ, Pastor so-and-so, but asking what was wrong with me and even D.A. Waite and Jack Mormon and these other TR guys. They got us all mixed up because he's new in the thing. 
He got an email back from Dr. Leaders. He just told me this story two days ago. He got an email from Dr. Leaders saying, first of all, I'm not your brother in Christ. He's a big-time Lutheran theologian. Got converted during the Jesus movement, joined the Methodist church, then switched to the Lutheran church. Yada, yada. And as far as those men you're talking about, I'd stay away from them. Grady and Mormon, those men, they're evil men. He got the email, read it to me over the telephone. They're evil men. Now, I'm done with this statement. Dr. J. Frank Norris one day stood up in the pulpit of his church in Texas after the district attorney of that area had been critical of his work and trying to shut his church down, all, all kinds of things, a backslidden or probably unsafe Southern Baptist man, fighting Dr. Norris left and right. God, Norris said, God, take care of him. One day, J. Frank Norris, according to the biography, biography uh, the J. Frank Norris I've known for 30-some-odd years, his Sunday school man wrote it. According to that authorized biography, J. Frank Norris stood up in the pulpit one Sunday night with a broken whiskey bottleneck in his hand, with the brains of that district attorney dripping off the bottle. He had been wiped out in a trolley car accident that afternoon or the day before, and one of his deacons came on the site and scooped up some of the brains from the sidewalk. On a, they had booze in the trunk. They had a broken whiskey bottle and scooped up some of the brains and took it to Dr. Norris, and Dr. Norris held it up in the pulpit and, pre and preached on this te text, Thou hast been weighed in the balances and found wanting. They said, uh, women fainted and strong men trembled. Here is Dr. Theodore Letus' obituary. Two months ago, driving down Interstate 75 outside of Atlanta, God just about got tired of this guy going across America for 30 years criticizing that book. And an 18-wheeler driven by a drunk truck driver squashed him like a bug. So you happy about it? I don't know, but the man after God's own heart one time wrote under inspiration, I will hate them that hate thee, O God. I'm somewhere between him and Paul probably. But Mr. Letus will not attack the King James Bible anymore. He went into eternity at the age of the speaker that you're listening to this morning. See, that's tough stuff, Brother Grady. Well, don't sing about the old-time religion unless you're willing to activate and function like the old-time religion. And you've got a verse in Jude that says, Earnestly contend for the faith. And I can't wait till we get home. We can put the swords down and kick back with Jesus and relax. But till that time, we're going to have to get tough for Jesus. And hanging there for the book. Don't forget Shibboleth, King James authorized English text, highest authority in the land. Thank you for letting me preach and thank you for letting me take some extra time. I can't even see the clock with the lights in my eyes so much, but I appreciate the graciousness and the time I've been given. I have a question or two for you. He's only, he's only a half an hour over. And um, I think I said 15 till, and he thought it was 15 after. I think so. Yes. I'm going to give, I'll give you that excuse on the ignorance of somebody from the part of the world. But I know some of these young people need to slip out. Uh, that I've held them up, and they've got to get to Kentucky. But I want to ask you a question. Yes, sir. I want to try to avoid some confusion. Um, missionaries, Mexico, Germany, people are using... The Spanish Bible they've got, the German yes. Bible they've got, leading them to Christ. Correct. We're certainly oh, not, yes. we're not, certainly not going right. to try to teach those people Correct. English just so they can read the... In places like the Philippines where there's lots of English speaking, that's the better way to do it. But in places where you can't do that, no, no, no not we've got a Bible. Correct. They've got a Bible and they, they have to get it. This school has always taken the position that we've never had questions about. We realize that we bear reproach. There's no doubt about it. I've constantly said to these young preachers, I don't want you preaching the cover. I want you preaching the Bible. A lot of them get on this issue, and that's all they want to talk about. And they never learn the Word of God. But like you said, it's all God's Word. The whole counsel of God needs to yeah. be preached. Not right. two or three things we're just excited about. Amen. Now, let me tell you this. I've managed for 15 years to stay out of the controversy that Bob Jones has with Pensacola Christian College. You may have drugged me into it today. <laughs> for that, I'm not grateful because I do not want to be in it. Mm -hmm. 
I want to stay out of it. They've been fighting for years, and everybody knows it. That's not my fight. Let them fight it out. We've stayed in this position. The other thing is Dr. Lee Robertson is alive, and I made a commitment to try to encourage him till the day he dies. And uh, I don't want to, I'm not picking a fight with those people. And I, what I want us to do, what I want us to do, I'm going to tell you something. When you hear somebody preach about this particular subject, you ought to feel like I feel. You ought to feel like somebody's going to beat the drum so loudly and so radically that it makes people stop and have to think. We don't have Peter Ruckman's books in our store, our bookstore. People have been helped by the fact that he's beat this drum on the King James Bible. There's no doubt about it. He's brought people back to have to consider things. Unfortunately, Dr. Ruckman's had a lot of difficulty, personal difficulty, family, home, marriages, this type of thing. And with a lot of people, that's disqualified him. But um, I, I understand where you're coming from. And how many of you young people understand that we need this emphasis on the King James Bible? You understand that? Because you don't want to ever leave a Bible college with things marked out of your Bible. I'm talking about the King James Version of the Bible you've got here. The truth of the matter is, I see kids from Bible colleges who no longer have any authority. They have nothing to preach. And once you lose confidence in this Bible... You don't have a message. You may jump around and preach in other parts of it, but you're not going to speak with confidence once you've lost confidence in any part of this Bible. You're not going to have any confidence left. Now, what you've done, and you're my friend, what you've done, you've, you've introduced a hundred phone calls, emails to me from around the world with people about these colleges. I just want you to know I don't want in that controversy. Let them fight it out. Let them fight it out. And they will. But the emphasis needs to be made on this Bible. And I'd be ashamed and disappointed beyond what you'd ever imagine if any of you young people ever left this school, went out and served God, and had any other copy of God's Word for the English-speaking world than the King James Version of the Bible. I'd be terribly disappointed. And you need to get that. If you can't get it nailed down in the Bible college, you can't get it nailed anywhere else. And uh, I, I appreciate that. God bless you. Let's stand together, may we? Amen. Now listen. Listen. It's one thing to hear a message like this. It's another thing to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. If all you want to do is jump and shout... And never get into God's Word and get God's Word in your own life, then you miss the whole message. You missed it all. You know, you don't bake bread to look at, you bake it to eat.